This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Welcome to NC Spin. I'm Brad Crone sitting in for Tom Campbell. This week, it's our back to school edition. We're discussing our public education institutions from our university system to the classroom teacher. As children start planning for another school year, we break down the policy and the politics. It's another week of NC Spin. Joining us on the panel this week, Howard Lee, former chairman of the State Board of Education. John Hood, syndicated columnist and author. Chris Fitzsimon, political analyst and columnist. And Joe Maverick, former speaker of the North Carolina House. We begin our uninterrupted debate after these brief messages from our underwriters. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end of life decisions, your family physician is with you every step for every stage of life for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Production underwriting support provided in part by the more than 65,000 members of the North Carolina Retired Governmental Employees Association. Agriculture. It's North Carolina's number one economic driver. It puts people to work. It powers our economy. And as agriculture grows, so does our quality of life. North Carolina Farm Bureau is proud to support agriculture and our farmers because agriculture connects us all. Topic one, controversy at the UNC Board of Governors. Newly installed chairman Harry Smith held his first board meeting two weeks ago. Mr. Smith called for board unity, trying to focus the university system on policy, not politics. But there's a raging war between Republicans on the Board of Governors. In the center of it all is former Raleigh Mayor Tom Fetzer. Tensions seem to be mounting over how we choose our chancellors. Joe Mavretic, tell us what all the squabbling's about. Well, it's not about policy and it's not about uh, politics. It's about power. Uh, think about this. Uh, Fetzer chooses a topic, an agenda item that has to be addressed in closed session. Uh, what he's trying to find out, of course, is uh, what the lineup is under this new president of the Board of Governors. Uh, there are a lot of old, uh, experienced politicians uh, on that board now. They understand what's going on. This is really a power struggle and uh, a side taking uh, time for this new uh, president. What's interesting is that he chose to do, uh, to, to make this move the same day that the new chair uh, has a conciliation speech. So I don't think there's any question this is a shot across the bow and we're gonna be talking about the moves on this checkerboard for a long time. Senator Lee, Mr. Smith put out a memo right before the board meeting asking board members to respect the experience and leadership that UNC System President Margaret Spellings brings to the table. Is that code language for us telling us that Margaret Spellings is a short-term president? I, I don't think so. Uh, I had my concerns when President Spellings was first appointed as to whether or not she could measure up to the pressures and to the implementation of programs at the university system. I've been impressed. She has done quite well. I think uh, certainly she has tried to manage in a way that it would offer balanced uh, approach to making decisions. And I just feel that there's a group on the board that will be disruptive no matter who sits in that position. And I think between President Spelling and the chairman, they will be able to weather and get beyond this. John, Tom Fetzer has a valid point though. We keep talking about how great our university system is, yet we can never find anybody in North Carolina to serve as one of our chancellors. Well, I think never is too strong a term. The chancellor at West Winston-Salem State University is a North Carolinian, the interim chancellor at Elizabeth City State is North Carolinian. 
But it is true that uh, the chancellor jobs for the UNC system, not just NC State or UNC Chapel Hill, but in other words, not just the research ones, but almost all the institutions have national searches or at least regional searches. They ended up hiring for most of these jobs, people who have academic experience, but from other states. Uh, so you're right that it's a legitimate concern. I don't think we should go all the way to the other side and say the only people we want at UNC Greensboro or UNC Chapel Hill or UNC Charlotte or East Carolina or whatever are people who are from North Carolina. That would be going too far the other direction. Chris, there's a lot of discussion, internal whispers, that Tom Fetzer may be interested in a position either as chancellor or maybe even a leadership position in the UNC system. Well, they're not just whispers. I mean, uh, two, he says two members of the Western Carolina trustees, where he was on, a member of the Board of Trustees before he was elected to the Board of Governor, put his name forward as interim chancellor. So the thought being probably he could have experience and then apply. I think it's important to remember what happened at this board meeting, though. Tom Fetzer went behind the back of the chancellor and the president of the university system and the board of governors, hired his own investigative firm, and now questions one item on a resume of a candidate for the chancellor of Western Carolina. We don't know who the candidate was. We don't know the questionable thing was. It's an extraordinary thing for one board member on his own to go behind the backs of the entire board and the president of the university system. I think it shows what, uh, that Joe's exactly right. This is a big power struggle. And uh, Harry Smith, the, the, uh, the board chair, uh, and Fetcher were allies. It's interesting that Fetcher is still challenging the, 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 uh, the leadership of the board. Joe, talk to us a second about how do you get back to the core mission of providing affordable higher education units? Well, before you get back to that issue, you've got to get the unrest and the turbulence on the board under control. And Chris is absolutely right. When you think about this, the chairman of the board almost invariably has to support the president of the university system. And when you have a, uh, a member of the board going behind the board doing uh, investigations on his or her own, that sends you a very clear signal that uh, Fetzer, and he's always done this, Fetzer is not a guy who likes to do things, you know, below the board, undercover, very carefully, uh, work things out smoothly. He doesn't do that. He's a guy who likes the, the spotlight. He likes to be in the eye. Look at his attire, for goodness sake. <laughs> he is well dressed, that Absolutely. is for sure. Absolutely. Well, that, and it tells you that sends a very clear signal about how he's going to approach things on this board. I admire his dress code for sure. We have new leadership at the helm of the state's community colleges. With bipartisan support, Peter Hans has assumed the role as president of the state's 58 community colleges. Hans is an experienced policy expert in higher education. He has a long pedigree in politics and a reputation for excellence. Chris, what should we be looking for with Peter Hans and the future of our community college system? Well, first, it's worth reminding people that Peter Hans was the choice of the Senate leadership to be the president of the university system when they chose Margaret Spellings, which kicked off a lot of this inner Republican uh, squabbling. Well, I think the community college system obviously is a vital part of our educational uh, infrastructure. It has a lot of functions, not just uh, teaching kids trades and uh, two-year associate degrees in employable fields. Uh, a lot, increasingly, kids are going there to, for two years. Students are going there for two years and transferring to four-year schools. It's also a huge economic development driver and is continuous good, I think in a good way, relied on by new businesses to train workers. It's a multifaceted mission. It's very complicated. It's a huge budget. There are lots of campuses. Uh, and this is a, a vital part of our infra political and economic and educational infrastructure. John, the community college system seems to be on a dual track system where they're doing academics and workforce training. How is that working across the state? Well, I think that if that balance has been struck, needs to be struck, and it goes all the way back to the very beginning of community colleges. Sometimes people say, well, today's community colleges are encroaching in the universities area, that they're doing, they're doing the first two years, they ought to stay away from college prep type of work or first two years work and just focus on industrial training and so forth. That is not what community colleges were originally signed up to do. Some of them were junior colleges. That's it. literally their purpose was to do the first two years of college for kids who might transfer. So uh, striking the balance is important, but most of the enrollment right now in North Carolina's community colleges is in curriculum programming, not in focused industrial training or other specific vocational things. There's a balance between the two. I think most communities want there to be a balance in their local colleges. Joe, how would you rate the success of the workforce training program for our community colleges? I look at what's going on in Wilson. UNC TV had an interesting report recently on the Bridgetone 
tire factory plant in Wilson and the work that they do with Wilson Tech in training employees to be able to go in. How important is that mission? It's very important at the local level. I was in the, in the house when the, the uh, tire company came to, to Wilson County uh, and it has made a, a great difference. But there are two ways to look at this. The first is the microwave. How is the community college, one of the 58, doing in their particular region? Uh, and I would say pretty good, not really good, but pretty good in supporting local industries. But overall, uh, the community college system really needs to rethink its issue. Uh, I disagree a bit with John. I don't think the balance is there. Uh, I think that there's a little bit uh, more focus on uh, uh, the first two years of a four-year degree, and I think that's because it's much cheaper to do it. Now, from a student point of view, statewide makes a lot of sense to go to the univers to go to community college for your first two years, and then go to the other to a four-year college. Howard, you were instrumental in moving the programs between the high schools and community colleges. As you step back and look at it now, how do you see that working? I think it's doing reasonably well, certainly not at the level I had hoped uh, we would be by this time. I certainly believe the academic emphasis is a very important one because it allows a very acceptable, expensive, uh, less expense education in preparation for a four-year college. I'm not sure that we have gone where we need to go with uh, uh, vocational training. I'm disappointed that our public schools have been left out of that vocational training loop. And I think community colleges could do the same thing for public schools that it's doing for universities. Work with the public schools, set up vocational programs, allow kids in the eighth and ninth grades to be able to get some preparatory work and then go to the community college for any advanced vocational work. At this point, if I were giving a grade, I'd probably give the relationship a B. Affordability is another key issue, again, for higher education, Chris. How do you see the community college playing in that space? Well, I think it's very important, and we have kept community college tuition low. John mentioned, or Joe mentioned, it a lot of it's cheaper, for, it's better for kids. Some kids who can't afford a university education get their first two years there. But I also think we have to keep university tuition low. We can't just have two years being reasonable. Uh, and I think that's going to be a continuing battle and a budgetary pressure. Let me, Affordability is going to be clearly a theme that we have to look at. Let's look at our public schools. The legal fights between the North Carolina Superintendent of Public Instruction and the State Board of Education seem to be subsiding. Both sides claim victory following a recent state Supreme Court ruling on who has administrative authority over our public schools. But the legislature's clearly signaled the green light to Republican Superintendent Mark Johnson. The superintendent recently announced a new office organization and additional staff. Howard Lee, you're the former chairman of the State Board of Education. How do you feel about governance of our public schools today? Well, overall, I'm, I never thought I'd hear myself say this, but I'm extremely disappointed in the Supreme Court to not clarifying this matter any farther than it did. I think it's made a bad situation even worse now because Mark Johnson has been turned loose to make all kinds of independent decisions from reorganization to determining what priorities will be in the department. And that, to me, is beyond the scope of the superintendent. Policy should be set by the state board and then the superintendent administratively administers the directive of those policies. And so I'm unhappy with the way things are developing now because I think we're setting up a very long-term bad problem with superintendents now coming in and undoing what previous superintendents have done and feel like they're free to do that. John, breaking news late this week, <coughs> Bill Kobe resigned as chairman of the state board. Is that the white flag? Well, I think it is, to take him at his word, I mean, Bill Kobe's had a long and illustrious career in public service in a variety of ways, from Congress to town manager to state board of education chair to head of the Republican Party. So I think it's time he wants to downshift a little bit. But I'm sure it's been frustrating. And frankly, the state board of education litigated. They lost. They lost unanimously. I'm sure that was disappointing on uh, Bill Kobe's part. W at some point, we've got to reconcile practicality with what the Constitution requires. That will require re rewriting the Constitution. Until then, we have an elected superintendent who, according to the Supreme Court, has day-to-day -day responsibility, including hiring. And you can't say to the superintendent, we're going to tell you everything to do and hire all the main people for you, and then you're going to run the department. That's not running the department. So I can understand why Bill Kobe's upset, disappointed. I don't think that was the only reason why he made the decision he made. I can understand it. But actually, I think this does bring some more clarity to the situation. Joe, 
Bill Coby was an elder statesman in the Republican Party, a former congressman, former athletic director at UNC Chapel Hill. Was it surprising to you that he would take this position and step down as chairman? How would you rate his governance? I think John uh, hit a home run. Uh, when you go to the, U the North Carolina Supreme Court and you lose, uh, it's time to go home and look after your garden. Uh, let me go back to something that Howard said. Uh, Howard's talking about the interface between uh, high school students and the community college in technical, in, in technical endeavors. The CTE program in high schools ought to be uh, in trace with uh, programs for blue collar work in the community colleges. And until we have the CTE programs in high schools in a county, uh, linked up with and clearly dovetailed with what the county needs, then we're never going to have the kind of production that we need for jobs that are good paying blue collar jobs. Chris, do we have too much meddling from the legislature into education policy in the state? Well, thanks for lobbing that one up here. <laughs> I still see the ball. It's still in the air. Absolutely. I mean, I think that is, that, that's a fundamental problem. We don't talk about them often enough as a player. There's a battle between, I agree with Howard, his analysis of the worries about the superintendent. The state board still sets the policy. But then the big 800-pound gorilla in, the, in this is the General Assembly. They forced, even they forced Marce Johnson to make budget cuts this year year that basically an audit said we shouldn't make that he didn't even want to make and he ended up cutting uh, folks that staff. helped and he cut staff of people who were trying to turn around the, the low performing schools which is the absolute worst place to cut so I think absolutely the General Assembly wants to be intimately involved not just with the budget strings but setting policy that's fine but then you, you, you can't have three we really have three folks trying to run our public schools plus, well four counting the governor. John what should be the top mission for the superintendent at this point in time as we get ready to go back to school? Well practically speaking he, he does have a bunch of uh, personnel and other matters to decide I think that Bill Coby did mention on the way out essentially that things had calmed down. There had been some conversations. I think that's true. I think that needs to continue. There was a dispute. They need to get past it as quickly as possible. Let's transition to the t classroom teachers. Earlier this summer, thousands of teachers from across the state rallied in Raleigh demanding more pay and better conditions in the classroom. After the rally, after the budget, we have to ask the question, did it make any difference? Chris, what's the takeaway from the teacher rally as we get ready to go back to school? Well, I think that uh, a couple things. First of all, we're talking about how much raise teachers got, whether it was big enough, whether it was uh, not enough, how it ma matches up, but that means that it's a top priority. So the teachers ha have managed, and I think a lot of other public school education advocates have managed to make teacher pay a part of the conversation, whether you're satisfied or not, so that's good. Secondly, I think there is an org it's a national movement. I don't think that people who are involved day to day in public education believes it gets enough resources and are sort of uh, a little tired of the anti-public school rhetoric, government monopoly schools and all the sort of the rest of it. Uh, and thirdly, I think it focuses attention not just on their pay, but on things like our school supplies in North Carolina, I think are funded 55% of what they used to be. There's a lot of, there's still things that need to be invested in in our public schools, not just teacher pay. Teachers are not just unhappy with what they're getting paid, they're unhappy with the conditions at their school. Sometimes the physical condition of the buildings, sometimes the class size, sometimes they don't have the resources and materials they need. So I think all in all it's a positive impact on our political system to get people focused on what public schools need. Joe, you've been Speaker of the House, <laughs> met a budget, balanced it. How do you finance the pay issue for teachers? How do you get them up to the national average incrementally? Well, the first thing you have to do is to say, where does the money come from? And the money comes from people who earn a living in North Carolina. If the average household income in North Carolina was just the national average, we would have $1 billion more at least in revenue at the state of North Carolina. That means because half of the revenue goes to education, that every year $500 million more would be available for education for supplies, for teacher pays, whatever. But until the entire school system in North Carolina, from K all the way through the universities, gets their act together rather than three separate silos and understand that their business is training people to earn higher wages in North Carolina, there's not going to be enough money to go around for education. John, school choice, a huge issue. 20% of the students now are either in charter, private, or 
in home schools. How important is that issue as we move into a new school year? Well, it's a significant issue for everybody concerned, whether it's district schools or chartered public schools or any of the other ones. It's clearly had an effect, particularly in urban areas. There's some urban areas where that schools of choice percentage is more like 30%. Um, I think that that's here to stay. I think parents have always exercised choices, but wealthy ones have had more choices. So that what this has been doing is democratizing the ability to make choices about where your kids go to school. I don't think we're going to go backwards on that, but there are significant issues to come about the quality of the schools that are participating, the supply question, how we're going to pay for school buildings in the future across all these different settings. So I think it's a it's an integral part of the conversation today. Howard, how concerned are you about the funding component between our public school funding channel and the charter school funding channel. The Democrats continue to say it's taking away from the public school missions. I'm not that concerned about the funding disparities between the public schools and the charter schools. Now, I don't think it's any secret. Most of you know that I'm opposed to voucher programs. But at the same time, I'm a very strong uh, supporter of parental choice. Uh, I think, however, if we were to put the same emphasis on supporting our public schools, especially teachers and principal salaries, as we do on dividing money among these other entities out there, too many of which have been developed recently, our public schools could rise up to the level we expect and produce a high quality student, which they are doing, even with the disadvantages they've been put in. Chris, is money the only answer for public schools to get them to the national level that we need? No, but we need significant funding. I think we need uh, a lot more support for our low income schools. I think we need to change this ridiculous A through F school grading system that penalizes schools in low income areas. Republicans in the House have tried to change it several times. The Senate refuses to go along with it. I think when you slap an F on, the, on, the, on a school door in a poor community, low income community, it's very demoralizing to the teachers, to the schools, and I think in, in some ways misleads parents into thinking, oh my gosh, I got to take my kids out of this school and take them somewhere else. There's a lot of solutions, but that's one of them. Let's go around the horn. As the legislature comes back next year, yes or no, teacher pay raises on the agenda and how high? Joe? I think it'll always be on the agenda, but I don't think it'll be a biggie. John? Uh, I think that it has always been on the agenda. That wasn't changed by the rally, really, and I think it will be sizable. Maybe not as large as 2018, but still sizable raises. Howard? I'm not sure the rally makes a whole lot of difference. Certainly long-term efforts on the part of teachers I think it'll be on the agenda, but I don't think it'll be that high. And Chris? I think it'll be on the agenda too, but it won't be as high because it's not an election year. We're at the favorite segment of the show for me and for a lot of our viewers. It's telling us something we don't know. We'll start with Joe Mavretic. Joe, tell us something we don't know. CEM Benchmarking is a Canadian company that looks at the administrative cost per uh, retiree for uh, retiree systems, the administrative cost, total cost. They find that the worldwide average, they track 350 uh, businesses, the worldwide average is $93 a person. North Carolina's average is $23. We are among the lowest 2% in the world on our cost for our retirement system. John Hood, tell us something we don't know. Uh, something that didn't get much attention in the state budget that was enacted this year was $37 million for a new system for tracking the assets and the programs of state government. Lots of managers don't really know all of the assets that are under their purview, the assets under other agencies. I'm talking about from motor fleet to properties to computer systems. This is essential. This $37 million will save us well more than that in the coming years if it's implemented correctly. Senator Howard Lee. I have not always been complimentary of athletes, especially black athletes, as role models for many of our, our children, especially young men. But I've been very impressed with the fact that LeBron James and here at locally the Holt brothers have put a lot of emphasis on supporting educational initiatives. They have given a lot of kids uh, hope and, of course, financed uh, opportunities for these kids, which I think should be applauded. Chris Fitzsimon, tell us something we don't know. The state of New Mexico recently closed one of its virtual charter schools, which is a private school that the state gives money to, run by a for-profit corporation. Ohio has closed virtual charter schools. The lowest performing school in North Carolina for two years in a row was a virtual charter school operated by a private for-profit company. But virtual charter schools just got another four years in North Carolina after struggling for three. I think that's something we need to look at. Absolutely, clearly. It's been my pleasure to sit in for Tom Campbell the last two weeks. Hopefully Tom will be back here in the anchor seat next week. You've heard our spin on the issues of the day. To stay informed all during the week, give us your feedback and to read Tom's weekly column, 
visit our website at ncspin.com or catch NC Spin on Facebook. Join us next week when we'll have more ballots debate for the Old North State. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end of life decisions, your family physician is with you every step for every stage of life for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Production underwriting support provided in part by the more than 65,000 members of the North Carolina Retired Governmental Employees Association. Agriculture. It's North Carolina's number one economic driver. It puts people to work. It powers our economy. And as agriculture grows, so does our quality of life. North Carolina Farm Bureau is proud to support agriculture and our farmers because agriculture connects us all. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNCTV network.